Yeah, you already turned it back on. Yeah, just leave it up. Just get away from the lock. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. You know, put another treasure in my mouth. Okay, so there's a red, we've got a red there. So that means that one we can probably turn on. All right. Just come over. Oh, I got a red here too. So let's go ahead and just try and turn them on once. And here's one to go. And we'll just see if it pops up. <laughs> It's two minutes. Well, I didn't realize what was going on inside of the vaults. So what? Kind of digital based culture. And we got the model number. Oh, wonderful. Yes. yes. <laughs> we can, can download it now. So. And it's coming back on. Yeah. All right. Yeah, so don't touch anything. Yeah, don't Outside? touch anything. <laughs> okay. Regardless of. We're just Whatever. not. Well, uh, all right. My mentor. Oh, yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Wonderful. And let's see. Great. All right. Okay. Well, thanks for uh, for thank coming. You. This is our last weekly seminar for BSAC for the semester. So, uh, one uh, one uh, request is that if you have any ideas about topics and or speakers for the fall. Just email me or, or Daylene uh, with any of your ideas, and then we'll try and uh, make some connections to get that set up. Probably be working on that in the next couple of months or so to try and get an agenda for the fall. So send us your ideas. Um, with that, I want to uh, introduce you all to Storm, who's going to be giving us a talk today on uh, atomic sensors that he's mounted or will be mounting on drones. Um, so there are connections to several projects indirectly that we have going on in BSAC, both drone research as well as research. But this type of sensor is a little bit different than the ones that we typically work on. So we're uh, anxious to hear about that. He's from the physics department. Uh, he's in Holger Miller's uh, group. And um, again, we welcome him today and uh, thank him for, for coming and giving some talk. Yeah. Exciting. So before I, I get started, I just wonder, like, how many of you guys have heard of an interferometer before? You good, just you know, making sure. So, uh, this is not my usual audience, so this flow may not make the most sense, but hopefully, it'll all come together by the end of it. First, I'm going to talk about just some general motivation for neutral sensors. I think this is something that probably this group will be more familiar with. Uh, in particular, I'll talk about uh, I'll talk about some results from our previous gravimeter that we worked with. Uh, then I'll introduce interferometry in general, and then specifically how atom interferometers work. And then I'll talk about the status of the FlyG project. And if there's time, I'll talk about one of my favorite little modules. It was kind of a dead end on this project, but it was pretty cool nonetheless. We'll see if we get to that last part. So uh, inertial sensors are used for a lot of things. You'll notice that I'm, I'm not mentioning probably the biggest market for them, which is like telling if your smartphone's upside down or not. <laughs> but there's <laughs> a few, a few what I think are more interesting uses are uh, ranging from geoscience, in particular volcano monitoring, groundwater monitoring, aquifers, and things like that, to fundamental physics, such as testing the inverse square law for gravity. We all know Newton's law, like, you know, GMM over R squared, but it hasn't really been tested for very small length scales yet. I think it's only been tested down to like millimeter scale, but we don't really know if it if that will continue if you go further down to micro scale. So that's something that inertial sensors can be used for. Uh, also, more fundamentally, there's the new SI definition of the kilogram that uses uh, a watt balance, and in order to calibrate a watt balance, you have to know very precisely the local value for gravity gravitational acceleration and compensate for gradient effects. So that's uh, an important for just fundamental metrology. You need these high, high quality inertial sensors. And then uh, at least in this context, the real money maker is actually in navigation in what they so-called GPS denied environments, such as outer space or underwater. Uh, and the idea here is that, you know, if you have an IMU, uh, these things have some offset, some small offset that will integrate up over time. 
So you can't, as of now, do any meaningful navigation using just an IMU. But the hope is that with this next generation of atomic sensors for IMUs, we can push that offset really close to zero and then maybe integrate up for a few days to weeks and only have moderate errors. Uh, there's some some tricks to make this work, but you know that's probably why these projects get fired in the first place. How do I change pages? There we go. So uh, in the field of grav gravimetry, people use these really funny units. So you're probably more familiar with meters per second squared, gravity acceleration. But you know, to pay homage to the early gravity guys, we use these units called Galileos, which are one centimeter per second squared. But you can think of a Galileo as kind of like a milli G. You kind of approximate G is 10 meters per second squared. One centimeter per second squared is only you know one in a thousand of that. And then uh, the the gravity anomaly on Earth is defined as uh, the variation of gravity from what you would expect from modeling the Earth, not only as a sphere, but as this like oblate spheroid. So there's like latitude shifts and centripetal force and things like that due to the non-spherical shape of, of Earth and its rotation. And then you can easily model that out. And then you can also subtract off the effect from the moon. And then you can look at what is the residual variation. And as you can see on this lumpy map, this is from Wikipedia, there's like a plus or minus 50 milligal. And remember, so a gal is a part per thousand, a milligal is a part per million. It's about 50 ppms of variation on large scale variation across the globe. That's a, an important uh, order of magnitude to keep in mind. So uh, the effect of moon's gravity is about 200 microgal, which is you know, you know uh, 0.2 ppms of local gravity. And these graphs here, these are some data from our, our last generation gravimeter. So this is, this is an atomic gravimeter, which I'll get into some details later. And what you see on this top graph is the gravity variation over the course of a month taken in the basement in our lab in Campbell Hall. And uh, what you see in this orange trace in the middle is the so-called solid Earth tide model. So that's assuming we have a rigid Earth and we know the orbital parameters of the moon very well, we can predict what the gravity variation will be from the presence of the moon. And then we can, you know, we can take some moving average of our data, subtract off this uh, solid Earth tide model, and we get some residual. And the residual, the scale is about plus or minus 20 microgal, so about 40 microgal peak to peak. And you can see that this residual signal is not so much correlated to the exact moon's gravity model, but is much more closely correlated to the, the water level at, at an observatory in the San Francisco Bay. So what we're seeing here is actually a gravitational effect from the water that comes in from the tide, which is slightly delayed from the position of the moon. And also the relative peaks and heights don't match exactly what the moon is doing because of also this presence of the sun. So that's kind of an interesting result here that we're able to see the effect of the gravitational effect from the water in SF Bay. And we don't know the exact physical mechanism for this. On one hand, you know, having a large mass of water come in and out with the tide has some gravitational signature, but the soil around the Bay Area is also very soft. So having this large mass come on actually can depress the crust a little bit and bring us closer to the center of the Earth. And that can have an effect as well. Uh, we don't know the exact details. We try, We collaborated with some geophysicists and they say that there's a, there actually is no model for this in our area because it's a very complicated coastline and absolute gravimeters are really hard to come by. Uh, in fact, the USGS uh, the local branch of the USGS doesn't own an absolute gravimeter. They have relative gravimeters and they spend 10 times as, as much time going back and forth to constantly calibrate their machines because they don't have the absolute measurement capability. Uh, so that, but yeah, that, that was kind of the highlight of our, of our first gravimeter. Ultimately, the precision of our sensor was limited by vibrations. And this is unavoidable when it comes to absolute gravimeters because of the equivalence principle. So the Einstein's equivalence principle says that Accelerations and gravity are essentially indistinguishable. And unfortunately, that also applies to vibrations. So in our case, we have like one mirror that everything is kind of referenced to. And that mirror, the vibrations of that mirror relative to the vacuum chamber couples in directly as if it was an oscillating gravity signal. And at some point, the project becomes just vibrationally isolating that mirror. And it stops really being like an atomic physics project. It's all about engineering that iso vibration isolation. Um, I mean, the, the majority, so you can, it's not super clear here, but you can see that we have noise on the range of uh, plus or minus 10 microgals 
on, on here. And then the signal, the residual signal that we have is about 40 microgals. So we have about four to one signal to noise ratio. Yeah. And in our case, we, we, we had like a minus K stage with like a, you know, negative spring constant to damp out the vibrations. And then we also attach some voice coils there with a seismometer to try to actively cancel them as well. And there's only so much we could do there. I mean, the, the time scales of these vibrations are like 10 to hundred seconds. So it's really hard to kill those. And um, on the flip side, I mean, there, there are sometimes are gravity variations on that scale too. So it's unclear how you can even separate them. We get our best data at night when people are not walking around and there's no cars driving. We are sensitive to that. Um, and Sometimes there will be like an earthquake on the other side of the world, and we can see that show up in our data little, little blimps. So it's unclear, are, are those caused by like oscillations in the shape of the earth that actually are a true gravity signal, or are they caused by surface waves on, on the surface that we want to cancel on? It's not so clear how to actually disentangle those sources. And that's one problem with absolute gravimetry. Uh, here's a comparison of three different uh, gravimeters. On the left, this is an FG5. This is a an optical interferometer. So in, in this case, they have a they have a mirror that's shaped like a corner cube. They shoot a laser up at it. It retroreflects back, interferes with itself, and they drop that physically in vacuum. And then by counting the interference peaks, they can essentially measure how fast this uh, this falling corner cube is, is falling. It's the state of the art for commercial gravimeters until the atomic gravimeters came around. These things are very expensive. They're like more than $100,000. They're really notoriously hard to calibrate. And one of their limiting factors, of course, is vibrations. They're dropping this heavy mirror. The mirror itself will cause vibrations. It limits the repetition rate. They have to wait for those vibrations to damp out before they can drop it again. And then there's all sorts of mechanical wear and issues that they have to deal with. And that's one of the that's the main motivation for switching to these atomic gravimeters, where the test mass that we're dropping is not a macroscopic mirror, but it's a, a cold cloud of atoms that you know, hundred thousand to a hundred million atoms. So the recoil when they strike the bottom of the chamber is completely negligible. Uh, so we don't have we don't have that limit on our repetition rate. We don't have self vibrations that that couple in from that. In the middle here, this is a, an atomic gravimeter that uses rubidium atoms from a French company called Muquans. They were the first ones to hit the market. And then, and then on the right is ours, which we called Mini G, which uses cesium atoms. And <clears throat> you can see that the uh, in terms of sensitivity. Our mini G was actually slightly better than the French one, uh, and it was, you know, kind of between the Muquans and the FG5. Uh, the absolute precision uh, we never could fully characterize because the only real way to do that is by going next to another gravimeter and measuring it. And there actually is like an annual meeting somewhere in Colorado where everyone brings their gravimeters to calibrate against each other. But we were delayed from COVID, and eventually our machine broke down, so we never got to do that test. And the uh, Muquans people haven't published it either. But the one thing that we do have is this long-term stability. So we don't know if it's absolutely precise, but we know that our our uh, relative to our own variations, we can get down to two microgal, which is comparable to what Muquans did. And these atomic grab emitters consume substantially less power and are substantially lighter than the commercial FG5 grab emitter. And it's kind of interesting that this like beautifully engineered system that Muquans did weighed about the same as our packed together 80-20 cart. You know, it's like <laughs> they had like 20 people designing this and they still couldn't really get it in a smaller and package. Include all the electrons. Yes. 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 Yeah. And in our case, I, I can't speak to how Muquans did their electronics, but in our case, probably at least half of the mass is like AC-DC converters on all the random electronics that we have, right? Because we have like a big, we have a big battery that has an inverter and then we plug in the commercial boxes and then there's like you know, AC-DC conversion on every single component. And yeah, that's probably a large majority of our mass there. Yeah. Yeah, well, really what dominates our power is RF amplifiers. And we use that for controlling our laser beams. We use a device called Kusto-Optic Modulators. Is that something you guys are familiar with? Um, some people are shaking their heads, some people not. Basically, it's a way that you can uh, steer a beam of light using a radio frequency. It does shift the frequency of light as well. Sometimes that's a feature. Sometimes it's something you have to tolerate. But uh, we use it for pulsing our lasers and controlling the relative power uh, between different beams. And each of those, to generate one watt of power, of RF power, takes 20 to 30 watts of wall power using the commercial amplifiers that we get from mini circuits. So they are not 
optimized for this, this process. They're just kind of off the shelf components. And those are things that I'm, I'm really surprised that the Muquans people weren't able to just hire an RF engineer and build an amplifier that would just do their, do the, do what they need with like 80% efficiency instead of 5% efficiency. That's the, the dominant the thing, dominant thing. For, for RF? Yeah. Yeah. So we use about like, we have, we need near 200 megahertz. We need two Watts of power. It's not very high, yeah. And then also at nine gigahertz, we need we need a about a watt of power as well. And there's one one piece of our microwave chain at nine gigahertz uh, is really critical, and we have to have very low phase noise. So we have like a DRO that's phase locked to a DDS, and it's kind of a complicated system there. Um, I don't have details of that in this presentation, but I'm happy to go into one more detail on that later. But yeah, the the microwave amplifier and the RF amplifier are by far our dominant power sources. So I, I talked before about the limitations due to vibrations. And one way to get around that is by measuring the gravity gradient. So the gravity gradient is actually a tensor, which kind of looks like this, where you can take the partial derivative or along any of the three axes of the gravity component of any of the three axes. And it might look like at first that you have nine components here, but there's some symmetries involved. So we actually only have six components. It's going to be symmetric and traceless, if that is relevant, for, if that helps you understand it. And the component that we would we measure here is the gamma RR, which is the vertical gradient. We measure the variation along the vertical direction of the strength of gravity. And because it it's sort of one derivative down from gravity, it has this one over R cube. So on, on one hand, the vibrations are common mode. Essentially, we have two gravimeters that are strapped together. So the vibrations, at least in the vertical direction, are common mode and cancel out. And also because it has this R cube dependence instead of an R squared dependence, it's much more sensitive to local mass distributions. So instead of measuring a 0.2 part per million shift on gravity where the large dominant background is just the presence of the mass of earth in the background, uh, we're measuring something that is now on the order of a few percent variation from the earth. So again, in the field of gravimetry, people use crazy units. So the gradient is measured in these etvus units, which have the uh, have the SI units 10 to the minus nine per second squared. It's 10 to the minus nine meters per second squared per meter. So it has this funny per second squared unit. And you can kind of think about like there's a time scale associated with this. If you just take one over the gradient square root and that time scale is the time scale of an of a gravitational oscillator. If you were to have if you were to have like a test mass in a uniform gravity gradient, then you would have kind of like a Hooke's law spring kind of thing going on. And that'd be the frequency of the oscillation. So you can tell that for typical gradients, these are very slow oscillations because they're, you know, the, the, the spring constant of gravity is not very big for most situations. And then we have, so just to like ground us in, in numerical values, the free air gravity gradient just caused by a spherical earth or an oblate spheroid earth would be about 3000 etmos, which is, 200 parts per billion per meter. So 0.2 part per million per meter, which is something that we were sensitive to on our previous gravimeter, which means that you know if we raise the gravimeter one meter, we can detect that gravity is weaker than it was, which is kind of a neat thing. We did a test in the elevator in Campbell Hall where we can see gravity get weaker on each floor. Um, and then over here, uh, I stole this figure from uh, an, a competitor's paper. They have such a great map here. I don't even want to attempt to recreate it. But you can see here they have uh, simulated this scene where there's water underground, there's like a tunnel, there's some buried, like hidden archaeological treasure, all these kinds of things. And then there's stuff on the surface, there's stuff below the surface. And then you can kind of just have a mass model for what these things might weigh. And then it's very easy to calculate at each point what is the effect, the, the, the perturbation on the gravity gradient from all these different sources. And you can see that the scale ranges from like, you know, 150 to 40 etvus compared to the 3000 etvus from the earth. And that's where I got this like 3% figure because like these biggest features are, are 100 etvus, which are 3% of the earth's background, which is really incredible when you think about it. Like you take this extra derivative and then all of a sudden this thing that's right next to you is only a factor of 30 weaker than the entire planet. And that's the power of taking gradients. Uh, so you have a much higher sensitivity to nearby objects and fundamentally, you're less sensitive to vibrations, which is a limiting factor on all absolute gravimeters.
So uh, similarly, I have this comparison showing a few atomic radiometers. Uh, on the left, this is the Birmingham group uh, run by Kai Bongs. And this is the guy who made that really nice plot that I just I just showed. And you can see they have the same kind of like hacked together 80-20 spirit that, that we have here at Berkeley. And then uh, as another comparison, there's this Lin Cert group, which is kind of like, as I understand, the French uh, NIST, more or less. And they have this really fancy box that they made. And they have an excellent gravimeter or gradiometer, but they don't take it outside the lab. They just kind of uh, they just kind of keep it inside. And they have uh, a much better long-term stability and sensitivity than the Birmingham group and a much better power consumption. And again, uh, I think the power consumption that the Birmingham group have, has is probably dominated similarly by RF and microwave amplifiers. And also uh, pretty much everyone else who, they use rubidium, we use cesium. And one of the differences between these atoms is that they can use a lot of telecom uh, hardware because the rubidium frequency happens to be like a nice multiple of a telecom frequency at 1550 15 nanometers. So they do frequency doubling and that's a, a huge power power hog. Uh, we don't we don't use that. So that's one reason why we can get away with having lower powers. Uh, we're limited by our laser power ultimately, but you know, trade-offs. And then uh, you can see that based on some calculations of our system, uh, we expect that we could have between 40 and 140 Edvus per root hertz of sensitivity. So we expect that we will not be able to beat the Linsert group probably, but we think we'll be able to do a bit better than Birmingham once we have our gradiometer up and running. Uh, also, our mass budget is much smaller than Birmingham, and there's no way that we'll even come close to 800 watts. You know, maybe we hit 300 watts, but we're, we expect around 200 watts average. So that's kind of the overview of the sensors and what we intend to measure with them. And now we can talk about how the measurement actually works. And I think it's much easier to think about a laser interferometer before we think about an atom interferometer. And the basic idea here is if you have a coherent wave, and this really can be any wave, but lasers are easy to think about. You take that wave, you coherently split it and then recombine it. That's all you do. But there's a difference between the two paths that you take. There's gonna be some phase shift in the wave relative to that path. And then when you do the recombination, you're going to have constructive and destructive interference based on that phase difference. And that phase difference can really come from just about anything. It can come from a physical path length difference, so there's some time delay, or it can cause come from a refractive index change, which is essentially slowing down the wave uh, through some, some medium. And this can be air, it can be glass, it can be just about anything. And then what you measure is the, the intensity at the two output ports that are related to the sine and cosine squared of that phase difference. So that's really all there is to it. Uh, you, all you need is coherent waves to interfere with each other in a controlled way, and you can have an interferometer. And this is the la this laser interferometer setup. That's how the old school absolute gravimeters work. It's how LIGO works. Uh, it's like a lab demonstration in undergrad courses. It's a it's kind of a, a neat thing. Now, the trick with atom interferometry is you kind of do the whole thing with the batteries plugged in backwards where now the wave is made of matter and the mirrors are made of light instead of the other way around. So <clears throat> it's a neat trick uh, and it comes down to quantum mechanics, every, you know, matter is waves and all this kind of good stuff. And then the, the two states that, uh, the two arms of the interferometer, when we do this split, they're tagged by an internal state of, uh, in our case of cesium. So we have light that's very near resonance with uh, this internal transitions. And by controlling the intensity and the duration of the pulses, uh, we can control essentially, I mean, we, we call them pi half and pi pulses. These are the same pi and pi half people use an MRI if you're familiar with that. So we have this like block sphere picture, you're doing a rotation, an internal rotation between these two states. And if you do this pi half pulse, the atoms go into superposition, of an ideally 50-50 superposition of having been excited or not been excited. And the atoms that have been excited well, they also have a momentum kick from the lasers themselves. And that momentum kick causes them to travel on a slightly different trajectory. And uh, in, in this kind of interferometer geometry, it's the area of this loop in space and time. The area of this loop uh, tells you the sensitivity of your interferometer to, the, to gravity itself. And this is the configuration for measuring absolute gravity. So here, phi is, is the phase difference of the two arms of the interferometer. And it's proportional to uh, K effective is the momentum of the light. And I say effective because you can do, uh, really we're doing two photon transitions, but uh, in principle, you can do any even number as well to get a higher momentum transfer. 
and it's proportional to this effective momentum with the dot product with the gravity acceleration, and then t squared. And you can think of this gt squared as kind of like a displacement. So it's really the k effective dotted with the free fall displacement throughout the interferometer that, that you'll fall. And uh, instead of measuring the intensity of light out through the two ports of the beam splitter, we measure the uh, the population difference along these two arms. And we are, we're sensitive to these two population differences because they, they're in different uh, internal atomic states. We can use lasers that are tuned to one transition or the other and measure the fluorescence from the atoms to tell how much atoms are in each of these states. And that's how, that's how we do an atom interferometer. And this is just some example of what some of the data might look like from uh, from an app from our absolute gravimeter, where you can see uh, we're varying something called the chirp rate, which is a way to actually scan the fringe. I don't want to get too involved in that, but that's how we that's how we can see the interferometer waves. And as we scan this big T, which is uh, the duration between our pulses, then we can become more and more sensitive to finer and finer gravity variations. And this is data from from the old gravimeter that we that we took. And then the uh, the gradiometer, the gravity gradient measuring uh, scheme, is identical except now we have two of these interferometers that have a vertical displacement between them, and the phase difference. Now this is I call this delta phi, which is the difference in phase difference between the two interferometers has the same form except now we've taken a we've taken a a, a difference, so now it's sensitive to the gravity gradient, and it's also proportional to this uh, displacement. And you'll see that's why we're kind of we're constrained to have a somewhat large sensor here because we need a large delta z and a large big T, which is the time between our interferometer pulses. So we have almost 200 milliseconds of free fall between each pulse. So we need 400 milliseconds of free fall and then an additional, uh, you know, almost meter displacement between the interferometers. And that sets a length scale for our experiment that we just can't get, get past. Uh, fundamentally, we could shrink this down if we could get higher momentum transfer. We're limited by laser power, and we have, for the line width of laser that we need, we have the highest power diode that we can find. And, you know, every couple of years, the company will make a better one, and we can improve our system, but there's really no, no way around that. And the way that we actually will extract the gravity gradient looks like this, where um, on, on these two graphs here, we have a somewhat a very noisy phase readout from each of the interferometers. But if you plot them parametrically, they'll fall nicely on an ellipse. And by fitting this ellipse, then we can extract the phase difference between the interferometers. And this noise is caused by the vibrations. So where we will not be vibrationally isolating the system and it's going to be flying on a drone. So it's going to look totally crazy for each of the ports. But when you plot it parametrically, then the vibrations can cancel out. And that's how we will do this measurement. So uh, the experiment sequence, the way that it works, well, I said we have to have a cloud of cold atoms. So a large part of the work here is preparing that initial state. And we use uh, a method called the magneto-optical trap. So we have lasers that will cool the atoms and magnetic fields that will trap the atoms simultaneously. And it's kind of a neat, a neat trick. Um, it takes a little bit of explanation to really get in the details of how it works. But the, the real basic way is that... Uh, you kind of have a conspiracy where the atoms will see because the, the, the real trick here is that when atoms are moving in a laser field, they will see a Doppler shifted laser field. So if you have all the lasers just slightly too low frequency and they're coming in from all directions, any direction the atom is moving, its velocity into one of those laser beams will cause the laser beam that opposes its motion to be Doppler shifted closer to resonance. And so it will see a, a, a scattering rate that is proportional to its velocity, and then it will get a, mo a momentum transfer from that beam proportional to its velocity. So it essentially has a viscous force, always opposing its direction of motion, and that causes it to slow down. There's more to it than that, but that's the like the you know zero order approximation. And there's a similar trick that you do with magnetic field gradients, so you can trap it both in velocity space and in position space. And it causes the atoms to collapse into a glowing ball, uh, you know, a few millimeters across with, you know, up to 100 million atoms there. And we can get them down two to three micro Kelvin within the course of one second or so from a hot vapor. So it's a tested method that is kind of a workhorse for the entire field of atomic physics at this point. And yeah, so that's the that's the first step. But then the atoms will be in a they will be in a combination of 
uh, a combination of their magnetic sublevels. And we want to be in a magnetic insensitive state. So we have to do this so-called microwave state selection process. So we, we blast the atoms with a microwave pulse, which will allow us to transition between their two hyperfine levels. And then we do a blow away pulse to get rid of the atoms that did not transfer properly. And at the end of that, then we have a, we, we know where the atoms are. We know that they have a low relative velocity and we know their internal state. And that that's the summary of the, the state preparation. Then we turn off all the fields, the atoms are free falling. In the course of that free fall, we do these three pulses, the beam splitting pulse, the mirror pulse, and then the recombination pulse. And I showed the pulse widths are different because you know they actually are twice as long for the recombining pulse. And that's the pi halves versus pi rotation that I was explaining earlier. So we have these three pulses and uh, obviously this time is not the scale. And then after the pulses are done, then, which, you know, they actually are five to 10 microseconds per pulse. Then we do a state selective detection to read out the population in the two different internal states. And we repeat that process many times. And from that, we build up a gravity gradient measure. So that explains kind of the idea of what we're doing here. And then now we can see some diagrams of the system and how we actually, how we prepare two of these uh, simultaneously vertically displaced from each other. Well, we do it with these pyramids these pyramidal mirrors. So uh, one key thing for our experiment in contrast to some other atom interferometers and other, other gravity gradiometers and stuff is that we try to keep everything as simple as possible. Uh, we use only a single laser diode for everything. Uh, we have no optical amplifiers. And the way that we can build this like you know conspiracy of Doppler shifted lasers is by having these right angle prism mirrors. So you can see in this picture here, the top down view, uh, if, I, if we have a really fat laser beam that covers all of these mirrors, uh, some of it will reflect off of each in the X and Y direction and cause an overlap region in the middle. And that's what's indicated here. And that's where the magneto optical trap forms. And then we can make two of these because some of the light will pass through the gaps in the first one and then go down to the second one. And the second one is rotated by 45 degrees to catch the remaining light. And that's how we make two of these simultaneously with the same laser beams. They have independent magnetic coils, but they have, they're have they addressed by the same pair of laser beams. And then here's a, a our lab is so cramped, it's kind of hard to get an actual picture here. This is kind of distortion here. But this is our, our vacuum chamber. It's about you know seven feet long in order to do this, this whole process. And it's wrapped with all sorts of coils for controlling the magnetic field. And then there's some optics on top for directing the beams in. So as I said, uh, we have no, no optical amplifiers. Our laser diode only has 300 milliwatts of power. Uh, we can control the frequency of our laser using a fiber EOM. So we have like around a few gigahertz of tuning on our laser. Uh, the laser itself only ha has a line width of about 500 kilohertz, which is fairly narrow, but not extremely narrow, at least for atomic physics experiments. But you can tell that it's narrow because we're not measuring it in nanometers. That's a, a good clue. <laughs> and it's, if you've ever worked with these kinds of laser systems, the real thing that you'll notice here is how bizarrely simple this is. Like there's only like about a dozen mirrors in place here. And all of this, you know, well, it fits on an area not much bigger than this podium as well. Uh, yeah, that's our, that's a picture of our laser system. Here's the actual boxes that they fit in. I don't know why it's cutting off here, but anyway. So we have one module that does our spectroscopy locking, one module that's our laser source, and then another module that's kind of our power router. And this is where the, in the spectroscopy lock, that's where we have microwaves. We, we, we need the one watt of microwave power. In the power routing, we need the two watts of RF power. And this allows us to have like uh, analog control of power on two different channels. It's kind of funny how we have to build this whole box just to, so that we can have a voltage controlled power output of two ports. Like, I thought this would be something we could just buy and it, it doesn't exist, at least for this wavelength. That's one benefit of doing things in telecom is that everything just exists, you know? <laughs> then we have the, the control system. So uh, because we ultimately want to put this on a drone, we built a lot of the stuff in-house uh, to eliminate the, you know, 15 AC-DC converters that I was talking about earlier. Uh, so this is one of the more complicated PCBs that I've had to design and I'm actually redesigning it now because we have a lot of uh, EMI and signal integrity issues with it. But uh, we have this STM32 microcontroller that is the brains of the operation. It's got a 216 megahertz clock, which is 
you know, moderately fast for a microcontroller, but doesn't have to be blazingly fast to do this. We only need 10 digital GPIOs, but we need a lot of analog outputs. And that is turning out to be one of the bigger issues for us. So we use these Max 11300 chips, where each of them has up to 20 channels, analog in or out, configurable uh, on the fly. And we need two of those chips. And to just minimize the amount of connectors, I'm routing the analog channels on these Ethernet cables just to save space. And that turns out to be not the best idea, but it does work. Uh, and we need to use strictly like Cat8 cables everywhere. So we actually have shielding. It's kind of funny the way we have it set up here. I'm using these SMA cables for our, our digital signals are shielded and our analog signals aren't. So <laughs> it's amazing we got this far before we discovered that this is an issue. <laughs> And we're really running these like across the lab too. So it's funny that it works, but we think that it is limiting us now. So that's why I'm in the process of redesigning it. So we have a few devices that are off board that we need to communicate to using SPI. And then we have many analog outputs and we only need a few analog inputs. Uh, and that's just to measure the fluorescence detection uh, at the end of the day of, to measure our atom populations. And then we have a bunch of these other modules that, that we use uh, primarily like in terms of floor space, the modules that we need the most of are current sources. And that's for controlling all of our magnetic fields. We have so many magnetic coils that we need to control. Uh, so we need, for each of the MOTs, we have like two coils that are independently controlled. And then we also have XYZ compensation coils to kill residual magnetic fields. And then we also need a bias coil uh, where the atoms are falling. We want them to fall in a uniform field. So that's one, two, five. So we need six coils per mod. So we need 12 magnetic coils uh, just for that. And yeah, so it's kind of kind of a mess. So that's why uh, this entire box here is just current sources. And uh, then we also need things like we need a microwave switch. We need our uh, we need a, a lock box to keep our laser frequency stabilized and feedback. We need uh, VCOs to generate the RF amplifiers or uh, the RF signals and all these things. And we try to do everything except the microwave stuff we try to do in-house. So the 200 megahertz is not so hard to do on, on, a, on a PCB, especially when you're not doing much besides just generating a sine wave and sending it around. But we're not gonna play around with the nine gigahertz stuff on, on our own electronics. So we use, we use stuff for that. We use commercial stuff for that. And those are the kinds of electronics that we need. And um, I spent far too long over-engineering this power supply, so that's why I included a photo so I get credit for it, you know. But the idea is, you know, we need to power all this stuff and everything we do, mostly analog, so we need really clean, independent power rails for every single module separately. And we want it to be able to run off of a single DC voltage, eventually a battery. Uh, so we have a single voltage input here, and then I distribute power along, like this, this uh, entire backplane is its own circuit board that has really thick traces to distribute power to each of these modules. And I use switching power supplies to turn a 15 volt into like a six volt and a minus 15 volt. And then we have low dropout regulators that give us a nice stable analog rails for each of the individual modules. And because it's a, a nice modular system, I also have like a few one-off modules that sometimes would be like a 24 volt or like an 18 volt, but we don't need many of those. So just kind of drop in replacement there and use switching supplies for that, for like our RF amps and things like that. So this turns out to be pretty useful. And uh, man, uh, our, our lab is like a chaotic spider web of BNC cables just woven everywhere. And using this system really simplified uh, a lot. And we haven't taken this outside yet, but even just in the lab, having a nice compact power supply system has proven really useful. And then uh, in summary, some like of our more recent data, uh, what you see here is a, it's a fluorescence signal of the atoms after they free fall for uh, a few you know, hundreds of milliseconds. So we, we, made our, we made a MOT, we drop it, and then we repeat this experiment many times with different offset times, and we measure the fluorescence. And the width of this Gaussian is a measurement of how much the cloud has expanded by the time it has reached the bottom. And this is how we extract our temperature. So this is an example of a three microkelvin atom cloud. So this is about as low temperature as we can get, and it's low enough for our purposes. And then in this bottom, uh, what, this oscillation that you see here, these are so-called microwave Rabi oscillations. And this is us changing the duration of a microwave pulse that's resonant with the hyperfine states of the atoms. 
And you can see that uh, when we do our state selective detection, we can see how the state oscillates with our microwave pulses. So this is a sign that we have cold atoms and we can control their internal state. And this is more or less where we're at at this point. So uh, we're having some issues with our state selection. Once we get those the state selection working 100%, uh, we're basically ready to start doing interferometry pulses. And then after we, we tune everything, do a million spectroscopy measurements, then we will trust the system and start measuring gravity. So that's where we're at in the lab. Uh, here's some pictures of our MOTS. Uh, actually, this is a little bit old. We have integrated the DDS and we have integrated the pulse width limiter now. So that's good. Uh, basic idea is that I don't trust my firmware very well. And it's possible to break things if we send too much laser power. And some of these modulators, you know, they cost $10,000 and they take two or three months to get a replacement. So I want hardware interlocks on as much stuff as possible. And we finally got that working so that this is necessary for us to do our interferometry pulses because we're we're really overdriving these modulators for five microseconds or so. So I actually put like a little photodiode right up against the fiber port to measure the backscattered light. So we can measure how much light we're sending into the fiber in real time and like interrupting uh, an RF switch based on that signal. So there's like a maximum time that it can turn on for. So if we send too much light and the program crashes, it'll do some like limited duty cycle pulsing as like the worst case scenario, rather than leaving it on continuously and frying our, our modulator. So that's actually working now, which is really nice. And then I did say that it's a flying interferometer, so I have to include some pictures of the drone. So this is the, the <laughs> we're having some big issues with our drone contractors. They they outgrew us during, the, during the, this contract period. When we started, we were the only contract they had, and now they have so many more projects, they don't care about us anymore. So they they flew it, they did a test flight, and they stopped talking to us. And I think they're just going to say, fuck it, we don't need the last payment, and they're just not going to deliver it. That's what I'm afraid is going to happen. But it did fly at some point. Uh, <laughs> it, it doesn't meet the vibration specs that we told them we needed, but it does fly, and it, it's the right size. So I guess <laughs> that might be what we're stuck with. But the, the idea is that the whole thing could fit in the back of a pickup truck. That's the scale that we're working with here. You know, 100 kilogram payload, seven foot tall actuator, and then a bunch of these electronics and optics boxes just like strapped all around. So that's what we're working with here. We wanted to, yeah, question? Oh, you said it's a tough problem. It seems like a vibration pattern or, you know, yeah, those kind of ask. Is it possible to get? It should be. So we did have them fly uh, a slam stick and we like did some simulations and it hit the targets that we needed on a smaller drone than, than this current one. And the aviation people we've talked to said that it becomes easier to, to hit these specs with bigger. So they hit it with a smaller one without trying too hard. So as long as they did their job on this one, it should be doable. And remember, the vertical vibrations are not such a big deal. And it's kind of interesting because like typically... Uh, when you're flying a sensor, you want to stay in the same place for very, like, very precisely. But for us, what we care more about is the accelerations. So we don't need it to hover in place necessarily. We would much rather it drift at a constant velocity than have a bunch of bouncing around to stay in place. Yeah. And really what you can kind of think is we have these lasers that define a detection volume and we need to drop the atoms in free fall and hit that detection volume. So as long as whatever motion the drone does in the course of those 400 milliseconds, as long as the displacement is about a centimeter across 400 milliseconds, the atoms will fall into the detection region and we're good. So that's that's the constraint is over 400 milliseconds, about a centimeter of displacement, which is not crazy for, for these drugs. And, re and remember, it's not it's not quite one centimeter of displacement. It's one centimeter of like accelerated displacement, because if there's a uniform drift, it doesn't matter to us because everything will drift uniformly together. Yeah. What's the, you say you produce with the DDS battery? Uh, yeah. So that is, let me back up a bit. This is the end of the main talk, so it's a great time for all these questions. So do I have a diagram that I can reference here? Okay. So in this picture, there's these, the, the probe laser that does these pulses, the, the atom interferometry pulses. Uh, it comes down, there's a retroreflector, and it comes back up. And it's actually the combination of the forward or the, the downward and upward beams together that accomplishes the, the pi half and pi pulses. And 
what we need to do is make sure that, so we, we use a we use a phase modulator to generate nine gigahertz sidebands. So there's like, you know, the sidebands coming down and up and it's some, it's not the fundamental, but it's some like offset between those two that actually does the, the interferometry pulses. So we need a very low phase noise, nine gigahertz source and one that we can shift in frequency because the atoms as they're falling, they also are accelerating. So we need to do a Doppler shift compensation as they're falling. So we need to be ramping the frequency at, you know, comes out to be 22.9 kilohertz per millisecond is the Doppler shift rate caused by gravity for these atoms. So we use a DDS around 100 megahertz uh, that we then inject into a phase lock loop with uh, with a DRO at around nine gigahertz that gives us that that scanning frequency. So that's how we do fine fine tuning control of that, and also the the frequency sweep is with a DDS. Uh, yeah. All right. The, somewhat unrelated question: Your solar system, you minimize the rate. Yes. You minimize the rate from Ah, well, yeah, that's a great question. Uh, the system was sealed and we had ion pumps. That's all we needed. Okay. So, yeah. So for this new system, uh, what kind of high speed? Uh, 10 to minus 9 to 10 to minus 10 torque is the range. And once you pump down, you can easily achieve that, maintain that with ion pumps. So there's no moving parts. Cool. Yeah. Question? Um, I guess it's more of a simple, but like, Minus why he decided to put it on a drone other than it's cool. Oh, yeah, yeah. You mean, but you can't, but well, you're doing over long distance so far. So I think the, the, the primary reason is because it's cool. Okay. So that is, cool. I think okay. ultimately, Holger has dreams of putting these things in space. And it's just like, how harsh of an environment can you operate atom interferometers? And everyone's racing to do this in more, like more and more like harsh environments. So on a drone is just kind of a, a natural next step. It's easier to do it on a drone than an airplane, just because you know you don't. There's like less logistics around it. You know, we were offered to take it on a blimp at some point too, but we couldn't because of COVID stuff. But they were just trying to put them wherever we can. That's really the truth. But I think the geophysicists are interested in this sort of thing because ultimately the thing that you want to do is make a map like this. And the reason you want to make maps like this. Sometimes you're you're studying the caldera of a volcano. Sometimes you're trying to do a site survey before a massive civil engineering project. And you just want to have as much information as you can about subsurface structures. And if there's like crazy rock topography, there's just no way you're going to be able to push one of these carts over there and also have it aligned and all these things. So having a drone that can just hover, I mean, even if the drone's on a tether, right? You have like a cart on the ground with like a massive power source and you have a tether just sending up power to operate this thing. Having it be able just to like hover smoothly over a rocky terrain is like a big target for the geophysicists. So that's something that they will actually want, but it is not really our primary motivation. We're just trying to see what we can get away with, you know? What is that? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Good, good question though. Yeah. 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 And we got the, the tail number we got was like N133CS. It was like the cesium isotope number. So it was going to be really fun, you know. <laughs> in find the submarines in gravitational. So submarines are tricky because they are neutrally buoyant. So they actually don't have a mass signature, right? But they have a low density region and then a high density shell. So in principle, they are detectable with, with gradient, but it's not easy. It's like a, a, a suborder effect. I think tunnel detection is the big one. And the Israeli government's really stoked about that. <laughs> they, they, they actually, they wanted our old gravimeter for that. And I was like, oh, we're still using it. <laughs> All of a sudden we take it apart for parts. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, it's an interesting thing, right? Because how else would you detect a tunnel, right? And one way is with like ground penetrating radar or like, like acoustic reflections and stuff, right? But all of those methods are, they're not stealthy, right? Like you can hear the acoustic waves and you can easily put like a microphone to detect those. And if you're really sophisticated, you can use antennas to detect the ground penetrating radar. But you can't tell if someone's measuring your gravity signature. They said to give us a big weird drop together. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. That's true. But, you know, in, in that environment, there's actually a lot of big weird drones flying around on the regular. They don't know what it is. <laughs> yeah. 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 Question. How accurate do you think uh, 
very young or I think they're very good at exploiting the side that yeah. So, yeah, it depends on what what are we imagining, right? If we if we had much more laser power, then we can do a, a higher momentum transfer. Where is it? We need more power, yeah. So we can, you know, in in the lab, people do. 30 H bar K, 60 H bar K, 100 H bar K momentum transfer pulses. In the field, no one's gone beyond two. Uh, it, the optics become much more complicated. The, the alignment becomes more sensitive. You need more power, all these things. So it's not really clear that the techniques that we currently use in the lab will, will transfer to outdoors. But if we just simply had more power in our diode, if we had a one watt diode instead of a 300 milliwatt diode, then everything else will remain constant. We're not at a position yet where we have to worry about like some of the high power effects where you have, you know, like heating of your optics and stuff like that. So everything will transfer over and then we could easily get, you know, six, eight, 10 H bar K. So that would allow us to decrease the, the height or the, the displacement of each interferometer. But, or, but then there's also the displacement between the interferometers that we would have to worry about. And so there's, it, uh, it, it's a little obscured in this formula, but it's quadratic in the size. So if you, if you shrink the size, you, you lose quadratically and it's only linear and laser power. So uh, I think there's room for innovation here. And there are, every aspect of the, this system is in the process of being miniaturized. There's a group out of, uh, out of Scotland in Strathclyde and they, they're microfabricating the vacuum chambers even. And there's microfabricated ion pumps. There is, you know, uh, I didn't get to talk about it much, but there are, like planar diffraction grading optics for generating for generating the light. There's planar optics for generating the polarization for all of these things. So if you're just trying to trap and cool the atoms, like you can do it in something about this big, but to actually get the, the free fall time, that becomes really tricky. Now, if you're putting these things in space and microgravity environments, you don't need as much displacement. In fact, you won't have as much displacement. So then, the, then they, they can be a lot smaller. Okay. Wait for longer time to build up. Exactly. You can just wait for longer. <laughs> but on on Earth, we have such a strong gravity background that we're kind of restricted to, to have these things be a bit bigger. There there might be there might be some really tricky ways. Like um, so, uh, in in my group, uh, we also have another project where the atoms are not free falling, but they're trapped within an optical lattice inside a cavity, and there they have coherence after sixty seconds. So they're trapping the atoms for a full minute and then recombining them. And uh, in that case, you you don't need it to be nearly as big. And I mean, their experiment is big because they haven't optimized it to be small. But in principle, you could have the cavity be a lot smaller. The atoms are only displaced by a few microns, but a long integration time. But then you have a very low repetition rate. So the sensitivity takes a hit because of the low repetition rate. How much energy it takes to keep the atom in spot and place for you? Well, it, this is actually uh, a subject of debate. Like, what is actually causing the phase shift? In quantum mechanics, anything that affects energy affects phase shift, right? Like, the, the frequency that a, a wave packet evolves at is just its energy. So, in some sense, you can think of it as the displacement. There's like a, an MGH potential energy difference, and you're actually measuring that gravitational potential. Uh, and the displacement is only like a few microns, but after a second, that integrates to quite a lot of radians that you can detect. Um, but again, the downside is the low repetition rate takes a hit on sensitivity as well. And it's also unclear what happens if you tilt them. Do they just fall out of the lattice or are they, do they remain trapped? Uh, that, that tilt experiment hasn't been done yet. But uh, the optics that are necessary to maintain that lattice are so much more complicated. It's unclear, again, when you try to take it outdoors, what are gonna be the limiting factors? Uh, you need two different laser systems and the, the cavity has to be very precisely aligned. And their vibration sensitivity is like in, intrinsically there because if the cavity breaks alignment, then everything falls apart. You need a high Q lattice. So if you were to somehow microfabricate the cavity so that it is locked in place in a small, objects so that there's no high frequency vibrations that can really disturb it, then maybe maybe there's a way to do that. Um, yeah, I think the, the best proposals I've seen so far, they use sensor fusion between classical sensors and quantum sensors. 
And the quantum sensors have a slow repetition rate, but they have a much lower background drift. And then by combining the high rep rate drifty measurements with the low rep rate low drift measurements, then you can learn these parameters uh, in a, a much more robust way. Uh, not, on this new system, we haven't done that yet, but on the old one, I mean, we we characterized it pretty well. And, uh, well, we had a seismometer, so we just correlated with the seismometer. And I mean, we, we do have an, yeah, we measured the transfer function of our, our isolator because we had uh, voice coils on it. So then we kind of had our own like bad shaker table for that. And that was good enough for our purposes. And then in the cavity, they measured the vibration transfer function using a similar method as well. And the, the cavity is actually much less sensitive to vertical vibrations than you might think because they average out after 60 seconds pretty well. But the, it's uh, sensitive to like the modes of the cavity itself vibrating. <clears throat> There are some proposals of trying to adapt that cavity for measuring, uh, for doing actual quantum gravity measurements. If you can keep coherence for much longer than a minute, like maybe 10 minutes or so, then you can start to see phase shifts caused by the gravity of the atoms themselves. And then you can start to do some fun stuff. But that's all theoretical as of now. But maybe on the next generation cavity, it might work. <clears throat> are any of you in Elf's group? Are you working on that ice draft concept or not? You're not there. Now we have a group here that's doing ice drafts. So, yeah, so some of the stuff that you were talking about is somewhat similar, but they're trying to do, they're all spread in. Yeah. What do you guys measure with the ion traps? Well, they're trying to make a fun of the so cute. I see. Okay. I see. Yeah, more colors. <laughs> The diffraction grade was my favorite part of this project. See, you can make any, any pictures of that is so much fun. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? Do you, do you ever consider assumptions that you make about this whole spherical Earth thing? <laughs> you consider this the, the theory of flat Earth? <laughs> That's the end. So we did consider it actually. So depend, oh, <laughs> depending on your model for the flat earth, I mean, we've measured the vertical gravity gradients consistent with the oblate spheroid earth model. We measured the latitude shift from here to San Jose. It matches the oblate spheroid model. So all of our data is consistent with around, around earth. <laughs> we did have a, a funny, in, so the gravimetry people are, are funny. There's all these, if you've ever seen like those bronze monuments kind of like, like in the ground from USGS surveys, they, people will take their gravimeters and measure along those exact spots for 50 years. And there's a trail up to, I can't remember, it's in San Jose. I can't remember the name of the mountain there, but there's a trail leading up there with several monuments that has not been measured with an absolute gravimeter in 50 years. People always did them with relative gravimeters since then because they, they, I don't know why the USGS doesn't have one here. It's crazy. So we tried to, we, we tried to do that. Uh, we tried to do that that sequence, Mount Hamilton, that's the name. And so we're at a park in, in San Jose measuring this, and we, we have a U-Haul truck rented out, and we're in the back of the U-Haul with where's the picture. <laughs> with this, with the, <laughs> with this device, and we've got oscilloscopes everywhere around a laptop measuring. And people come by and they're like, what the hell are you doing? And like, oh, we've detected a gravitational anomaly. Like, you guys ever heard the mystery spot? <laughs> we're we're afraid of one of these popping up around here. And we did that to like 10 people just yeah, having, a, having a laugh with them. And then the park ranger comes up and, <laughs> and she starts talking to us. And she's like, what are you guys doing? Like, we're just measuring gravity. And she's like, like, I don't know if you need a permit for that, but it sounds like you need a permit. So you got to get out of here. And I was like, at this point, the machine is running. We're almost done. So I'm just trying to delay her, you know, like, <laughs> like, what do you mean permit? Like gravity is free for everyone. Like you can't, you can't not measure gravity. Like you're, you're just there all the time. <laughs> and then she she was like, you got to go now. And so I said, what are you going to do? Call the cops? And then, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> she's like, I am the cops. <laughs> and she made us get out of there. But we got the data by then, so it was okay. <laughs> so, yeah, it's contentious. People, I don't know what they're trying to hide. Find out. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah, so it's been fun. I mean, it's one of the few 
physics projects in our department that you can get a sunburn operating. <laughs> so unfortunately, uh, we're stuck in the basement all the time now because we're building a new one, but maybe someday it'll see the light yeah, of day. Yeah. One other fun tidbit. This, uh, this, whoop, this figure here, measuring the gravity from the moon, you can think of this as kind of an atomic calendar. You've heard of atomic clocks, but we can tell what phase the moon is in without ever leaving the basement. We, <laughs> exactly. exactly. <laughs> yeah, so it's the, it's the dumbest atomic clock you can imagine. You can tell within a couple hours what time it is. <laughs> So the, the further you go, the weaker the signals become because they drop off like our cube. So in an ideal case, you would want to you'd want to be hovering close to the ground, basically just high enough that you don't have like ground effect messing with your propellers. And that's that would be the ideal, ideal case. And then the resolution is going to be given by how good your flight controller is. So like we would we would target from from a drone, we would target kind of like 10 meters resolution or so. But then if we're on the ground pushing a cart, then we can get meter resolution. So the same Yeah. And and that's that's the name of the game with with ground penetrating radar, with gravimetry. That's how you, there's no other way to do it. Well, I mean, there's if, if we if we made it bigger, that would only decrease our resolution, right? So uh, our our vacuum chamber is you know like literally this thick, so it's about as you know radially it's about as small as it can be, and then it's just a matter of how how many data points do you want to put position it. And I mean, there's there's really a lot of like data science that goes into making these plots, right? Like you have to have if you know nothing about what's beneath the surface, then it's going to be very hard to interpret the data. But if you know that there's a tunnel, but you don't know how deep it is, you don't know how wide it is, then you can do some like Bayesian estimation on just those parameters and do a much better job than if you have no knowledge. So really, uh, I think that's the way that these need to be operated. And again, with, with ground penetrating radar, you're sensitive to changes in like the index of refraction at the RF frequencies, right? But you're not sensitive to the density. But with uh, the gravimeter, you're sensitive to the density only. So in combination of mul multiple of, of these different uh, detection methods, then you're able to have a much better picture of what's going on in the surface. And the only time you would do a site survey like this is really for like a civil engineering application where you're taking lots of core samples, you're doing lots of radar, and then also lots of gravimetry. And then together you can tell have a picture of this. Body. And that's the kind of thing that, I mean, if you're building a dam and you miss like a two inch layer of clay, <laughs> That can you know kill ten thousand people in a few decades. I mean that has happened before. You know, there's like giant like floods in a valley, right? So in that case, that's when you'll do these kinds of really really high intensity scans. Yeah, but I mean just just last year at the AGU conference, there was some people doing gravimetry surveys where it was like a volcano that people had known for a long time, and then they did a, a survey of the gravimetry, and they could tell there was actually two calderas next to each other, so there's two volcanoes. So that's the kind of thing you can learn from these things. And I believe that every active volcano should have a gravity observatory dedicated at all times to it, because you can detect when the magma chambers are swelling just by the mass of like the lower density magma compared to the colder rock. Like you can see that very clearly. And that's a, a nice thing to know, <laughs> you know, be able to predict the volcano before it blows up. I've been told by the geophysics collaborators that volcano monitoring in the U.S. is like the worst uh, every developed nation. So talk to your congressman or something. Well, thank our speaker again.